Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I will say a few words in Lithuanian to present this event for audience here at Kona's bus station, and then we will turn in English for the rest of the time. Labas vakaras visiems, kurie esate šį vakarą Kauno autobusų stotyje. Esu Monika, Kaunas 22, Europos kultūros sostinė. Šį vakarą čia vyks diskusija, kuri yra Ukrainos šiolaikinio mano trienalės programos dalis. Diskusija vyks anglų kalba, tad kiek laiko būsite čia, kviečiam jūs pasiklausyti, galbūt užduoti klausimų, dalyvauti ir būti šio renginio dalimi. Dėkojam Kauno autobusų stočiai, kuri šiltai mus čia priemė ir linkime gražaus renginio. Good afternoon uh, once more to everyone. So here we today have the second discussion that is uh, a part of Ukrainian Contemporary Art Triennial, Ukrainian cross-section with the team Ukraine Unmuted this year. So today we have a discussion moderated by Oksana Forostina and I will give a word for her and uh, our guest uh, today. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you again. Uh, that's our second discussion, and uh, I will remind again to our online audience and also people uh, here who are listening to us that that um, the part of the fifth uh, biennial um, uh, triennial of uh, uh, Ukrainian contemporary art. This time in uh, Kaunas, we again we are very grateful to uh, our Lithuanian partners for having us. Uh, here and I encourage everyone uh, to visit the exhibition in Kaunas Post Office as uh, as soon as uh, you have a chance. And uh, the the special thing about uh, Triennial this uh, this time is uh, that we also have discussions and the um, uh, book of essays coming uh, on uh, Ukrainian culture. The idea was from the very beginning to um, to talk about the uh, the issue um, the, the the issue in question, which is presenting Ukrainian culture to the world from two perspectives. Um, mostly, one is uh, Ukrainian, and uh, uh, the other one from outside, from other countries. And uh, tonight we have uh, Jacek Denel, uh, who's a, a Polish uh, writer and artist, and uh, and translator. His uh, novel Lala is uh, translated to Lithuania. Highly recommended. I, I think we will mention it several times during. Uh, during our talk, and uh, Jacek lives in Berlin uh, now, and uh, Yaroslava Stucha um, came from uh, from Kiev. Uh, she's a literary scholar, had uh, her own course, special course on Ukrainian literature and culture in uh, Harvard University, and she is also a translator, so very welcome, and uh, thank you very much for joining us uh, here in Kaunas. Um, uh, we will uh, will talk about uh, empires uh, today. I realized that uh, if you open a newspaper or a magazine on a, or a website uh, these days, reading the news sooner or later you are bumping in the um, uh, in the term again, uh, empire, imperial, in the, in the context of uh, war, uh, war in Ukraine and Russian invasion um, uh, to Ukraine. Uh, but I, I would uh, encourage our guests uh, tonight to talk um, broader uh, about empires, not just the legacy of uh, uh, Russian uh, Empire, which is of course crucial to our part of the world, both to Poland and to Ukraine and to Lithuania, of course, uh, but also about uh, uh, about others, uh, other empires, and also about this ambivalent legacy we got from them. Not only uh, empire violated uh, our uh, our people, our our nations, but uh, sometimes our people also used it. Uh, so I. Um, 
uh, I would uh, um, I would invite Yaroslava to to talk first uh, about uh, UK this Ukrainian ambivalent um, uh, ambivalent uh, relations with uh, Russian Empire and first of all of uh, Ukrainian elites. Uh, which uh, which is a topic of uh, your academic interests, first of all. So you're very welcome. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you for everybody who came. Um, and thank you so much for the excellent uh, questions that does not have any straightforward answers. Uh, because in many ways, we were not just uh, the victims of the empire, we created this monster. Uh, back in the 18th century, Ukrainian territories, the territories that are now Ukraine, uh, were more intellectually developed. They had more universities, that ha they had a more stable intellectual tradition than uh, uh, the parts of the empires that are now Russia. Uh, so our intellectuals were complicit in creating this imperial project. Our intellectuals have been complicit in coining the myths that lay at the foundations of this empire. And uh, now sometimes we are uh, grappling for the heritage and legacy of writers and intellectuals with Russia, whom we are trying to reclaim as our own, uh, when in reality they were one, some of those who created the justifications for this empire. For example, uh, Nikolai Gogol, as he is more commonly known in the Russian version of his name, or Mikola Gogol, uh, is one example of that uh, split identity as somebody who was born in Ukraine, who was very steeped in Ukrainian culture, uh, someone who probably spoke the language at least to some degree, uh, who chooses to become a member of the imperial central elites. Uh, and uh, we can track his progression and his uneasy allegiances through his writing. Uh, the most famous example of that is probably Taras Bulba, where we have to editorial versions, one from uh, 1835, uh, which is uh, uh, where uh, the name Ukraine is featured, where Cossacks are uh, described as this anarchic element on the outskirts of the known world, but they fight for themselves. Uh, whereas uh, we have the second, much longer uh, edit uh, from 1842, uh, where suddenly all mentions of Ukraine disappear and are replaced with Russia, even though the period that has been described uh, predates the Pereyaslav agreement when uh, the Cossack land uh, becomes subjugated to the Tsar. And uh, that final text where uh, Taras Bulba uh, is very much fighting against the Poles uh, and for the sake of the Russian Orthodox faith and the Tsar, uh, is a product of its time, as the time post-November uh, uprising of the Poles uh, in the Russian Empire. Um, so um, we have somebody like that who is uh, working actively for the imperial center against other minorities, who is erasing the specificity of his own group. Um, and we are trying to reclaim that heritage. And then, of course, we have uh, people who just lived in the empire without necessarily contributing actively to its ideological project. Uh, but of course, even then, the empire imposes this complicity in this gray zone where no choice is uh, morally neutral. And uh, we have, uh, I mean, these people had this uh, dilemma of uh, what do you do? Do you compromise to a certain degree and then you can do some good work? Or do you hold your ground, you don't bend, and then you die in exile without having accomplished anything much? Uh, a good example of that is uh, Cyril Mesodia's Brotherhood, this uh, um, cultural, religious, mystical uh, uh, union from mid 19th century, uh, yeah, mid 19th century. Uh, where one historian pans uh, a justification for the special role of uh, the Ukrainian nation. Of course, it's based in a large part on Księgi Narodu Polskiego i Pielgrzymstwa Polskiego by Adam Mickiewicz. It uses the same messianic tropes, but now for Ukrainian culture, uh, where uh, 
I don't think we are clear about the authorship, but that's probably Kostomarov. Um, where he describes the uh, downfall of all nations who were all created equal, but then they choose Tsars and they choose to insert some of their population. And Ukraine, which has never enslaved anyone, becomes this messiah that can uh, offer a model of a just society to other nations. Um, of course, the uh, Tsarist regime did not take kindly to this message of uh, equality and uh, um, anti-authority stance, even if there was no radical element that was advocating actual, you know, military fight against the regime. As a whole group is arrested, some people compromise like Kostomarov and get off easily and can continue doing good work. Kostomarov, who's, uh, I mean, we have the protocols of their interrogations. We know who ratted out whom, we know who uh, behaved uh, like what, so Kostomarov gets off easily and uh, he's instrumental in creating the vision of how you write about Ukraine, which does not have a state. How do you still write about it as a continuity? You focus on the fault traditions, blah, blah, blah. Uh, some people are less flexible and more moral in the interrogations, and they go down for years of exile. Uh, Taras Shevchenko, the National Bard, is exiled for like a good part of the decade. He cannot create much during that time how many more of his poems and his paintings we would have had uh, um, had he behaved differently. And um, in other periods, uh, you cannot even say, oh, somebody was moral and was killed, didn't create much, but gave us this moral example, uh, and somebody else was more flexible and survived and did something good. It was very random. Uh, if we move on to another empire, namely the Soviet, uh, imperial or quasi-imperial project and uh, look at the outcome of the Stalinist Great Terror is the 1930s. Uh, you cannot say that somebody like, the, for, for those familiar with Ukrainian literature, somebody like Tichina or Bajan, this wonderful poets who start out as very experimental avant-garde symbolist, and then uh, they survive the Great Terror, they become functionaries in the system, ministers of culture, they become uh, the singers of praise to Stalin. Um, so you cannot say that they compromised and that's why they survived. Uh, many of those people who died uh, were writing uh, denunciations, like Urenets was writing denunciations of uh, other writers, was killed in the same time. And uh, then there were just people trying to live their lives and that's still a hard position that the writers uh, who worked in Ukrainian have been reflecting on since the 19th century, for example, Lesia Ukrainka, a very canonical famous writer who's on Ukrainian currency, um, has this drama uh, set ostensibly in the Roman Empire uh, during the time of the persecution of Christians in the Roman Empire, uh, where she describes a lawyer who is Christian, but he has to hide that fact. Uh, to make sure that he is seen as unbiased, so he can sometimes protect Christians in court. Uh, that's clearly a metaphor of somebody like your family, who work in the imperial administration, but have to hide their pro-Ukrainian sympathies. And she shows this lawyer who is insisting on his unbiased position, lose his children, uh, one of whom becomes acculturated in the majority culture, the other becomes kind of a sacrificial figure. Uh, so, uh, no matter what you chose in the empire, just not sticking out and doing your thing quietly or sticking out and paying the price and then not creating much or like compromising and then contributing to the strengthening of the empire, none of these choices were good and we have to like reflect on this gray zone and in many cases we cannot say, oh, this writer should be, uh, you know, swept out of the canon because he or she uh, did too much for the preservation of the empire. Uh, it requires nuances and uh, we are just beginning to do that work. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Yaroslava. I, I have a temptation to ask more uh, question, uh, questions for you uh, regarding of what, what you just said, but maybe, maybe later. 
Um, I, uh, I have a question for Jacek, and uh, it comes uh, mostly from, uh, from, from your novel Lala, which is translated to Lithuania. Uh, that's uh, another reason, uh, reason why we are focused on that. And there is this picture from, uh, from Kiev, you know, Jacek's family has uh, had origins in, in Kiev in, the, in times of actually Russian, Russian Empire, when Kiev was a part of Russian Empire. And this picture of these memories of Kiev uh, is very sweet. You know, it's, it, 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 they, they, they are charming in, in some way. And I think that that's what many of us feel from, from time to time, that all this imperial um, uh, imperial excess, uh, imperial uh, uh, imperial uh, greatness, so called. It's a kind of seducing. I mean, I mean aesthetically. And do you have problems with that? I mean, like in uh, uh, in a problem. Of course, uh, of sorry. Uh, of course, um, empires have money. Empires can construct things. Empires can afford beautiful buildings, like Empire State Building. <laughs> um, empires can bring the railway tracks and build great roads, like the Roman Empire, which is like the backbone of the Roman Empire, is the system of roads. Um, so uh, we make use of it. We, of course, we are attracted by certain privileges that this money brings gives to us it's like with palaces i mean like you you cannot really have a nation building palaces or a society building palaces without someone's uh suffering palace is a certain form of a of a living quarters in which 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 basically comes from huge social inequalities and yet of course if we travel to this place or that place, and we are tourists, we love to see those beautiful palaces and those great collections of art. Uh, and we tend to forget that there is certain pain behind all of that. Uh, on the other hand, of course, if you amass money on someone's suffering, you don't necessarily have to spend it on beautiful arts of wor works of art and palaces and great roads you can also spend it on golden toilets or whatever so uh, so um it is also um a certain decision in those who run the empires whether we should build things for the general benefit this way or another of course it always benefits more the ruling class of course it always uh, benefits more uh, the ethnic majority, not the ethnic minorities, etc., etc., etc. So there is, it's rigged in the very center. However, um, there is a certain good that, or, or comfort that comes from the power of, of empires. When it comes to my family in Kiev, I don't think that they perceived it as a, a sort of Russian imperial uh, city. It would be difficult, different if they spoke about Moscow or Petersburg. Uh, but in Kiev, I think they, they sort of felt that this is such an international con uh, city. Uh, there, was, there was a lot of Polish people back then in Kiev uh, in 19th century. It was an important academic center for Polish students. Um, my great-grandfather came to Kiev after he was imprisoned in Siberia for taking part in, uh, in an uprising against Russians in 1863. Uh, and then he spent some time in Siberia, then he graduated, became a professor, and, and he was a professor in, in Kiev. So I don't really think that he perceived, or those family perceived that as a sort of imperial um, city. However, my great-grandfather uh, was, well, and this is the problem, was he Russian or was he Ukrainian? So, uh, in that times, in spite of being from a Cossack family, his name was Karnauhov. And what I heard, it means a cut off ear. So it means that either his ancestors lost ear in a battle or they were thieves because they were cutting off ears of the thieves. So 
this is this is some kind of a murky family story and this is you know a man from there he comes from cossack family or he's educated he however his grandfather is a director of a school in kiev he personally is a lawyer so he's a member of the local elites and i know for a fact that he had his cossack identity and that when when my grandmother watched a, a movie in the cinema with with her parents her mother would say, look, that your daddies are on the horses and they are the Cossacks on the horses, and your, your daddies. So he had this Cossack identity. And at the same time, he was, he, he, he would say, uh, little Russian borscht, not Ukrainian borscht. And he would say uh, that, or, or, or my Polish family would say that he's Moscow, he's Russian. So that, this is this thing that we know from many uh, countries that when an empire comes, an empire that is ethnically different, it partially forces the ethnic minorities into joining by um, by violence of all kinds. But at the same time, there is a certain allure, a certain charm of this mag magnificent imperial culture that can afford this palace, this villa, this church, or sobor, or whatever. And somehow it becomes fashionable to be the part of the imperial minor, mi majority, not the poor peasant uh, minority. We know it from African countries. We know it from United States and, and Indians uh, of the United States, etc. So this is a very complex thing because it is easy, of course, to say that those people from minorities who joined the empire are somehow, I don't know, uh, that this is a treason or that they were stupid, but uh, it is far more complex than that, I think. I don't let you go. <laughs> uh, and I, I, I would like to share a kind of a personal account for, uh, for, the, for the next question. I, I'm, I spent a month in, uh, in Vienna this year, and I lived uh, not far from Hofsburg and Kunsthistorisches Museum, so that was the area I uh, I went to work with uh, with my kid, with my with my daughter, so and had some time to reflect. So there is this huge monument of Maria Theresia and these two beautiful museums, and I I had to admit that first of all I I like this again I like this greatness uh, aesthetically. So maybe maybe I reveal a bit taste now, but but it's it's beautiful. Uh, at the same time, I look at this Maria um, Theresia monument, and I know that's a, an important figure for many uh, for many of my Ukrainian compatriots, especially from uh, from Western Ukraine, because that was a good uh, experience for them. The, I, I mean, Habsburg Empire helped them to get some kind of uh, political agency and to uh, actually to develop a national proge uh, project in that. For many reasons, not all of them were sentimental, not all of them was humanistic, but that, that happened. So it, Ukrainians mostly uh, have good memories of Habsburg, but there is also Polish part of me, which realized that's the same, the same person, uh, the same, uh, well, it actually destroyed, uh, destroyed the country, and she, uh, she was not a humanist, humanistic at all. So, and uh, I'm, I'm puzzled here. I think that would be uh, a bit easier for a Pole because. You don't have a good empire in in your Polish. Oh, we do. Oh, oh we do, and they are the Tell me. and they are the Austrians. And this is the funny thing, because Poland was partitioned between Austria, Prussia, and Russia, and gradually, with time, with changes of borders, the majority was in Russia, and small parts were in Austria, and or smaller parts were in Austria and Prussia, and then Germany. And out of all of that. Joseph II, uh, um, uh, um, uh, Franz Joseph, the emperor who lasted for what, 70 years almost, um, is a figure of sort of our good emperor, like in, uh, in Schweik's uh, story. This is the good emperor who is peaceful, who takes care of his uh, subjects. Maybe he's not extremely interested in 
Krakow or Lviv or, 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 or Drogo Besh, but at the same time, he knows he has those cities in his empire. He sometimes comes, he waves the hand, a little bit like Pope, a little bit like Elizabeth II. This is this kind of figure. At the same time, of course, the Austrian administration, Austro-Hungarian administration, was extremely efficient in, in um, playing this game of different uh, ethnic minorities in, in Galicia and playing them against each other, Ukrainians about, uh, against Poles, Poles and Ukrainians against Jews, Czechs against Slovaks, whatever, whatever uh, it was. There was the gov governor called Stadion who said that his main task in Austria is keeping those 16th century, is, is 16, uh, sorry, those 16 uh, dif different ethnic and uh, national groups into constant struggle. So they are fighting themselves and Austria is safe. Um, but yet, at the same time, there is a huge sentiment towards Austria. Why? Of Franz Joseph. Because in comparison to Prussia, and especially to Russia, this partition was least uh, aggressive. So they allowed Polish language in the university. Uh, you could have some kind of Polish, um, rather folk that na than nationalistic, but still some kind of Polish identity celebrating that. Uh, Polish uh, members of the parliament became important politicians. They would be ministers of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. They would come to to the Austrian parliament in their Polish national costumes, like like Hungarians, like and uh, like anyone else. So uh, this was a different tradition than the Russian tradition, especially, which was the tradition of you cannot have anything of that because it's just too dangerous if you speak your language or whatever. So in, in comparison to that, there is a legend of Austria-Hungarian Austria Empire as the, as the good ones. Uh, I, I suggest to come back to Kiev with, uh, with Yaroslava. And we, we have all, um, actually uh, during uh, maybe seven or eight years, we've, uh, we've been having these long discussions about decommunization and also decolonizations. And uh, one of the arguments of uh, the, uh, the opposition to uh, decommunization was, okay, but part of uh, um, uh, architectural legacy uh, uh, monuments in, uh, in Kyiv uh, is in fact uh, uh, imperial, you know, like for example, St. Andrew's Church or, uh, you know, Mariinsky Palace or, you know, some sightseeing in Kiev will uh, link you to Russian uh, Empire sooner, sooner or later. So how can, especially taking into account what you said before about this um, uh, the story of cooperation between U Ukrainian national elites and uh, Russian imperial state uh, uh, state system. Uh, where is the line? How? What would be our good approach to that? How can we divide our and imperial? I don't think there is a good answer. I don't think you can divide it like that. Um, and often the same symbol would have two very different meanings for somebody um, speaking from the imperial mainstream, the center, and from somebody speaking on the margins. Uh, take, for example, the monument to Bogdan Khmelnytsky. Uh, yes, who was... Cossacks were a very ambiguous figure for Ukrainian intellectuals throughout a significant part of the 19th century. Uh, they are ambiguous for Taras Shevchenko. They are, of course, very ambiguous for somebody like more democratic, like Drahmanov. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Bogdan Khmelnytsky can be a compromise figure who, on the one hand, is celebrated by the empire because he is the one who brings this lands under the fold of the empire. On the other hand, he has some local specificity. He can have meanings for uh, pro-Ukrainian groups within the city. 
and uh, it's a hilarious story that lasted through basically the whole second letter part of the 19th century, this history of how this monument was erected and uh, discussions around how do you frame that monument. Does this uh, mounted statue on a horse, does it necessarily have to trample the figures of uh, Catholics and Poles, or maybe we can do without that? Uh, and uh, uh, how do you sign that? And people who are known for their pro-Ukrainian political and cultural sympathies were on board with that project, the uh, historical uh, clause of uh, the statue were created by Antonovich, who is definitely familiar to everybody uh, in the like, Ukrainian cultural history sphere. Um, on the other hand, it was framed on the plaque as uh, uh, a gift from the united and indivisible Russia to Bogdan Khmelnytsky, so it was a um, memorial site for the empire. Uh, then, of course, after Ukraine uh, gains independence briefly uh, on the tail end of the First World War, uh, when this uh, socialist but not Soviet uh, state uh, emerges for a brief second. Uh, people try to take down that plague, but keep Bogdan Khmelnytsky as a local um, memorial site. And Bulhakov, who is also a native of Kyiv, but uh, with very pro-Russian allegiances, describes that moment of resignification in apocalyptic terms. The sky turns red when people try to resync. Khmelnytsky as a Ukrainian figure rather than as an imperial figure. Um, then, of course, uh, 19th century, what we think of as the quintessential Kyiv look, of course, uh, uh, it was not this mythical, unified, golden past, uh, because uh, the, the monument battles were there, the architectural battles were there. There were so many buildings uh, trying to emphasize the unity of the empires, this churches in Neo-Byzantine style, Volodymyrsky Sobor, where the frescoes uh, show the key uh, events in Christian, uh, Russian uh, cultural and historical heritage. Um, so yeah, how do you divide something like that? I don't have a good answer. I don't think we will ever get a good answer. Probably more nuanced takes that uh, don't uh, succumb to this uniform uh, imperial myth that glosses over many of the ambiguities. That's a good start. So I, I have another difficult uh, question for you about the, the same. Uh, to what extent should we appropriate these things? So, for, for, for example, I think this Khmelnytsky uh, um, monument, which is uh, very, uh, very well known, the, you know, the landscape of, uh, of Kyiv, even to foreign tourists, uh, but it, it, I think it's already uh, appropriated, actually, as, uh, as, uh, you, uh, as, as Ukrainian. But as for others, uh, other legacy, uh, again, do, do we need to appropriate everything? Or there is something that we should uh, definitely label as imperial? Uh, well, for one, uh, one usually, you know, scoffs at the idea of cultural appropriation. Cultural appropriation is usually not seen as a good thing, uh, but we've been spectacularly good at appropriating and using in our favor the image uh, that was produced by the empire and that was used as a weapon against us. Take, for example, the idea of Ukrainians as this simple folk that dances well, sings beautifully, does not have any intellectual uh, cultural validity on its own. Uh, that's, uh, by the way, I think this myth was uh, not originally, you know, an imperialist uh, orientalist take on Ukrainians. That's probably a product of somebody like Kostomarov, whom I mentioned. Like, how do you write the history of the state if you don't have a state? Well, you turn to folk customs and folk traditions as a justification for, we have always been here, we exist. And uh, it becomes uh, a weapon against us in the Soviet times, in the 1930s, well, starting with the late 1920s, uh, when uh, this earlier um, 
cultural decentralization disappears altogether, Stalin comes to power, and you get this very strict cultural hierarchy where um, high culture is for Russian and all the other like ethnic minorities, Ukrainian included in the Soviet Union, uh, they are just there as this colorful ethnographic displays. Uh, but then fast forward 70 or like 60, if you count from the uh, 1930s, fast forward 60 years, Ukraine regains independence and people start looking for a foothold for uh, cultural artifacts that are untainted by this, you know, legacy of cooperation and collaboration with the horrible cannibalistic system. And people turn back to this ethnographic symbols as, you know, the untainted golden age legacy and do wonderful creative things with it in terms of pop culture, like think of our like, uh, performances at Eurovision, Go A, which mixes folk music with electronica in visual arts. Uh, using parts of like folk aesthetics and doing various creative things with it in literature. Uh, so we have been very good at appropriating uh, reclaiming the slurs used against us and uh, doing some good things with it. And uh, whether there are things that definitely cannot be reclaimed. Well, I would argue justifications of violence should like uh, justifications of imperial violence is something that you that you can study from the history of literature perspectives but you shouldn't put it on a pedestal you shouldn't glorify it like theoretically one could even reclaim like bulgakov i i wouldn't do it but theoretically people are trying to reclaim bulgakov as uh, you know a part of kiev history but um a lot of his works are basically justifying the erasure and violent erasure, not just cultural erasure, violent destruction and murder of uh, Ukrainians. Uh, Gogol or Gogol uh, with Taras Bulba, which is in its final version, very anti-Polish, anti-Ukrainian, anti-Semitic, uh, is another like borderline case where uh, maybe not glorifying it, but approaching it always with a critical eye to these uh, more problematic parts would be probably a good idea. Okay, I uh, again, I have a, t a temptation to, um, to go on on Taras Bulba, but I will not. <laughs> uh, I have a kind of tricky question for, uh, for Jacek. That would be a question on taste. Uh, so correct me if I'm wrong, but if you are completely ignorant on art and culture, but you have some, you know, some kind of intuitive and if you are a snob, it's a safe choice to like uh, something um, either imperial or radically modernist than uh, to like some of, you know, this national art, like romantic art, art for example, in, in Polish. And uh, actually Poland, uh, has his this long tradition of criticizing and uh, uh, even mocking anti-imperial romantic art, literature, paintings, and everything. So, uh, I mean, like, like Gombrowicz, for, uh, for 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 example. So, um, is it just? I I I realize that it's very, uh, the 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 whole outline is very shallow, but is it just that? this national anti-imperial art is aesthetically challenged? <laughs> um, I think it's more complex in Poland because Poland on one hand was a victim of empires, but on the other hand, it was empire, it was a colonial empire in a way, it might be argued, uh, which Ukrainians know all uh, just all too well. Uh, so, uh, when we criticize, let's say, Shinkevich, we don't criticize him be because he was going against Russia, let's say, because he wasn't that much. Um, and it, he was just referring to the great golden past of Poland, the times when Poland was imperial. And in fact, his large parts of his texts are uh, today very problematic if they are read by U Ukrainians, for instance. 
So um, I think this is what Gombrowicz was fighting with. Um, then there is this extremely interesting case of w Pustyni w Puszczy. So this is a story for children about children of a Polish engineer working in Egypt for English. And his children are kidnapped for political reasons. Um, and this is the story of the children. So anyway, those children are kidnapped because there's Mahdi in Egypt and Mahdi wants to regain independence uh, for Egypt from the English. Um, Stasinel, uh, Stasinel, those two, two kids, are children of a man who comes from Poland, a non-existing country, because his own, own country is divided between three empires, but he's working for the English empire here, and this very bad Mahdi figure of this terrible political leader is a figure of man fighting for the independence of his own country, who is in a very, very similar position to what Poles are in that period. And when you read it today, the discrepancy be, be, be between, you know, accepting one independence and not accepting the others um, is striking. So um, I think this is problematic here, that in Poland, um, in contrast to really small nations, for instance, which were never imperial, uh, there is this ambivalence between um, dreaming of independence, but, all <laughs> but it's very close to dreaming of your own empire. When only Poland regained independence in 1918, they started the Colonial League and they said, why everyone in Europe has colonies and we don't have colonies, we want colonies. Let's take someone else's colonies. We need colonies. And nothing happened, luckily, out of it, because it was all taken. Uh, so luckily, we don't have this kind of colonial uh, past in, in uh, Africa, for instance. Um, but, uh, but I think this is, I don't think it's an aesthetic problem. It is a problem of uh, that any grown-up nation, any nation um, that is ready to question its own history, which is, I think, absolutely crucial for any kind of modern nation that wants to be democratic, uh, respect European values or humanistic values or the human rights, then this kind of discourse, the this kind of questioning your own literature, your own culture is extremely important. Not that saying that, okay, everything Polish or everything Ukrainian is crap, uh, why aren't we French or why aren't we, um, I don't know, British with their great culture? No. I mean, questioning, and this is also what Americans do or French do or, or English do, questioning those tricky legacies, this tricky legacies of, of violence towards minorities, of violence to, uh, towards other countries, uh, of, of imperial um, conquests and, um, and of sort of uh, squeezing out the, the vital juices of other groups for your own benefit. So we have to question that, but I, um, Frankly, like the Polish romantic literature is not that much questioned by, by, by this. It is more, you know, the 19th century, this problematic legacy of, of dreaming of Poland as an empire that is, uh, that is, a, that is crucial here. Because Mickiewicz's tra the tradition of, like you mentioned, similar one in, in Ukraine, of, oh, we are, the be we are the poor nation, we are going to be the Christ, and other nations will get better thanks to us. It is silly, it is understandable um, from the political point of view, from the historical point of view, but it's not hurting anyone. Whereas things that Sienkiewicz did are hurting and they, uh, and, they are, uh, and they are problematic, although at the same time, for instance, he had a lot of compassion for um, Indians in the United States. Because there he recognized that there is something wrong with it, but he didn't have that in Africa. So this is, this is a very complex problem. Tinkiewicz may be seen, you know, as problematic, but Ukrainians are so used to like being 
villains in this like mainstream narrative that when the movie version of uh, Ognem Amechem came out, it was absolutely celebrated and venerated in Ukraine because yes, we might be the villains, but it's the first time we are seeing ourselves on the big screen in a production that is not, you know, Soviet. So just representation, yay. <laughs> no, but this is one thing. But another thing is that Poland was already in this moment after 1989 that large part of of um, of the crew was Ukrainian and it was not only the actors there were also people working in the produ production and it was sort of you know working together project even if we know that this is there is a certain problem with this prose uh, this kind of cooperation is again you know it is going in the right direction Okay, we, 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 we have our problematic literature from the past, but if we do it together, if there is participation, if there is this representation, then it's better. So this is something I liked about this movie, that there was a, that was a huge co-production of Poland and Ukraine with lots of Ukrainian actors, and, uh, and it sort of makes this, this um, aggression milder, this, this, this problem softer. Yeah, you cannot strip away all of the Orientalism because it's at the core, but it is definitely a more nuanced portrayal of the whole panorama than uh, Sienkiewicz probably envisioned. Um, uh, okay, that uh, will be the next question for, uh, for both of you. Uh, uh, again, uh, a shallow one, uh, and partly connected to, to the previous, uh, but... Um, do we still need, I mean, at this point, do we still need uh, a revision of, uh, of the national uh, canon, both Ukrainian and Polish? Uh, I mean, if in, in the, at this point, we are already behind the revision of uh, our imperial legacy uh, for, uh, you know, for, for many years, but maybe there is something new that was revealed just you know just uh, just recently and uh, that's especially uh, 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 maybe Yaroslava you would answer it from the uh, point of view of uh, academia because it's uh, the world is uh, quite close to you say it again from the point of view of, uh, of academia uh, so do we still need another vision of uh, the uh, of the national canon um, yes, we do, because uh, um, I'll use the metaphor of canon and uh, iconos, uh, like altar with icons uh, that was first introduced by Marco Pavlishin, this uh, Australian historian of literature of Ukrainian origins, uh, who juxtaposes these two models. On the one hand, you can have uh, literature as a set of icons that are not there to be engaged with critically, they are there to be venerated. And that's what we inherit from the Soviet Union, where the writers are not necessarily there to be, you know, tackled from the post-colonial or feminist or what have you perspective. They are there to provide a model of how to be a good Soviet man or woman. And uh, once Ukraine regains its independence in 1991, uh, people who have not uh, been used to tackling literature critically, uh, they do not begin the discussion of what this canon could look like. They use the same approach of literature is there to be venerated and provide models of good citizenship. And they just add more icons without necessarily uh, disposing of the old ones. Uh, so you get dissident writers who... Uh, died for their beliefs and uh, fight for freedom uh, without necessarily any attention to their works. Uh, like, for example, there is this great, fantastic, lovely poet Vasil Stus, who happened to be a dissident and died in the camps in 1985. Um, and recently, a, a dossier of his interrogations by the KGB was published, and uh, he is lawyer, essentially a prosecutor at that time, um, was an influential figure in Ukrainian politics and he tried to get that book banned. And uh, just as a show of, you cannot do that, you cannot silence our history, uh, people began to like 
by these really, really boring bureaucratic documents about uh, police interrogations, the uh, print run of these police dossiers that is not, you know, good reading, uh, has surpassed, I think, the print runs of his actual poetry collections. Uh, so he is not important because he is a great poet, which he is. Uh, he is again venerated as this, you know, fighter for freedom. And on the other hand, you can have a canon, which is uh, a more flexible structure based on a public discussion uh, of uh, like, what do we need? How do we see our culture? How do we deal with its less uh, savory, more problematic uh, parts? So I think we uh, need not so much a revision of the canon as we as a nation and mass need to learn to read and approach our legacy critically uh, rather than, you know, as ready-made, easy to consume uh, pictures. Yes, like I, I realize that you, uh, you have, you, you were, you, you had several revisions of the canon lately. I mean, uh, I mean, in Poland, maybe not of them were good. So maybe you can pick up here. Well, it's always such a problem with 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 the canon because when we think about canon, it's mostly the canon in the educational system. Uh, because of of course, we also have a canon which is not connected directly to the education, like what any person in our society should know and you know uh, I don't know Harry Potter gets there probably for the younger generation uh, it's an absolute must if you want to understand the context the cultural contexts of many jokes and um, although the school prob probably would not be happy to have it that you know that important in in the in the, um, in the canon um, However, I think it is like you, you can read Harry Potter at school, maybe not now, but maybe a few years ago. Hard to tell. Uh, I don't have kids, so I'm not, you know, interested in, in how it changes. Um, the largest problem is that lots of those books are just boring. And this is the death of literature when you stuff children with boring literature. And this, those books are there because someone who is 60 now was and who is deciding about that uh learned that 50 years ago and it was put in that st structure of, of of lectures by someone who was already 60 back then you know this is a, this is a transmission of a very old pattern and i don't mean the great pieces of literature like hamlet or antigone or uh whatever um Bible, I don't mean the great books, the great international books of the world literature that should be in that, uh, in that canon, but books which were popular in, in 1930s, like books for children from 1930s. And there are, of course, great books like that from old times, like Moomin's, like the children of Bullerbin or whatever, or Anderson's uh, stories, fairy tales. But there's plenty of very mediocre literature from 1930s, for instance, which children now are fed with at schools. Those books are not important in any way. Uh, they are not part of the world literature. They are not showing the great dilemmas of humans on any level. It is just someone in 1930s said, okay, this is a popular book, let's put it in the, in the canon because children are going to read it and enjoy it. And then someone puts it back in 1960s and then someone puts it back in 2012. And this is totally insane because there's plenty of this kind of books which are liked by the children now and it is very slow that they enter this group. And when they will enter that eventually, it will be already after two generations and there will be completely new books. So I think there is a canon in which um, we learn the basic texts of our world literature, the basic texts of our national literature and history because it's often mixed. And then there is a large group of texts which should be changed very fast because their um, task is not 
to teach children of anything in particular about our pasts or about culture. It is to make them engaged in reading, to make reading attractive, to show them how um, books create other worlds and how those worlds can be attractive to you in this terrible, terrible period when you're growing up, which is absolutely the worst period in your life. And literature is a great way of escaping from those uh, problems and dramas into something, uh, you know, um, outer, which helps you out. And, um, and I think that the, the, any canon should be very careful about this distinction between those three groups. Um, so I think this is the largest problem in the, in the educational system in Poland. And the other one is, I don't, have, I don't know if you have that in Ukraine, there's this terrible belief that is given to children that any, literal, uh, any text of literature is like a riddle, that it has one solution. And, and the, the teacher says, and, and, he, uh, and he or she says, so what did the poet have in mind when he wrote this poet? And he has the, you know, he has the answer to the riddle in his book. And all those 30 kids in the classroom, they are supposed to, to read the text and find the solution that he has in that book. But this is totally against the idea of literature. Literature, as any art, is an open uh, way of thinking. You can come to many conclusions. And, but of course, if you have school, and the school wants to give you not only knowledge but also propaganda then of course you need texts with one solution because this is important for for passing the propaganda to the next generation uh, okay school and education is one of the several uh, several dimension of this you know imp imperial legacy and that's what that's my 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 last questions to both of you it's a bit personal um do you do you feel empire under your skin? Are, are empires still there? Or, or maybe empires are history already? I see the appeal of empires uh, because empires are good at projecting the idea that an imperial culture is not political, that it's neutral. It allows you not to ask yourself hard questions. You can read Jane Austen and not ask yourself where the sugar on the table is coming from. Spoilers, slaves, slave labor. This is where the sugar is coming from. Uh, but uh, imperial cultures kind of allow you not to think about that. You can enjoy Downton Abbey without thinking about the political background or the class inequality and what have you. Um, since uh, writers from minority groups, colonized uh, nations are deeply aware that their cultural choice is not the default, they tend to tackle those kind of questions. And uh, um, yeah, you are more aware of this hard things uh, the need to take a stance. So I see where the appeal is coming from in uh, Ukrainian culture. I think our pervasive uh, love for British literature that is uncritical uh, uh, is our way to, I mean, it's not unproblematic. It was a way to escape the cultural influences of one empire, but by embracing another empire, when we could have embraced literatures of various African nations, for example, which would have been more relevant as cultural models for us. Uh, it would have made more sense to experience solidarity and to look for uh, dialogue partners there, um, instead of you know, in the British literature, so I guess, uh, uh, yes, there are all those. Uh, and uh, also with the current situation when there is this ongoing conversation about what to do with the pervasive presence of Russian culture in the international cultural market, so to speak. Uh, Ukrainians who would have uh, probably been more useful discussing Ukrainian culture are forced in the position where we have to talk about Russian culture to show its, uh, you know, 
uh, chauvinist, imperialist underpinnings because uh, scholars of Russian literature are not going to do that. They are going to admire their Pushkin without looking at him critically. Um, so, and we cannot uh, get rid of that function. So even as we try to walk away from one imperial culture, either into the embrace of another imperial culture or just our making our own way that uh, zombie of the imperial culture drags after us and tries to um, collect its teeth at our shins. Well, I think that first of all, we, we have empire under skin because we recognize it easily. Uh, today we walked together through Kaunas and we've seen this square with St. Michael's Church. And you instantly know that, okay, this is a new part of the city that was, I mean, new when it was built. And there's a large church in the middle of the square. It is a garrison church. It was a Russian church put here basically as, a, as an imperial symbol of, of domination. Um, and I instantly recognize that because I come from a country which was occupied for a very long time. Um, you know, what you you see that in lots of funny little things like names of food, uh, like uh, you know that, for instance, certain kinds of 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 uh, products which are associated with with large imperium uh, empires are are going to the to the menus of restaurants of national restaurants in smaller countries. Um, um, yeah, like you have beef stroganoff in Poland, everywhere in lots of restaurants. And wh where did that come from? <laughs> uh, so um, I think we, we being part of the former empires, um, living there and knowing all those, uh, you know, remains, all those underneath structures, we just have that in a, under our skin because we just know how to recognize that. And people from from the metropolis, they're very often, you know, but this is how it how it is. They are they're like, yeah, this is how the world looks like. Man, not really. This is how the world looks like when you are the member of the majority. And when your things uh, that you treat for forgiven and obvious uh are popular, but not the other way around. It's of course the situation of, of for instance, um, British people abroad speaking their own language, and they are often like irritated that someone does not speak very good English. And they're like, yeah, but if the history, you know, went the other way around, perhaps you would have to learn Czech in on the British Isles to uh, to speak with anyone in Europe because that would be the international language, or whatever. So. Um, uh, you know, this is this. Uh, I think that the, the under the the the, the, hmm, the ability to recognize the, the the imperial structures is something that that we all have. Uh, just because we were born not as the members of the of the ruling majorities. Uh, I thank you very much. I'm very gr uh, grateful for your brilliant, brilliant inputs. I'm very uh, grateful to our hosts uh, here in uh, uh, in Kaunas. Uh, Kaunas is uh, European capital of culture this uh, this year, and we are uh, we have great partners here. And I'm uh, thank you very much for everyone who watched us online and you don't see it but well, well, if you watch uh, watch us online you don't see it but there are a lot of people here at the bus station who uh, actually disturbed by us they, they're doing their own business <laughs> waiting for a bus uh, so um, Jacek Denel came from Poland, Jaroslava Stricha came, came from Kiev, and uh, that all happened thanks to International uh, Renaissance uh, Foundation. Actually, they brought us uh, here. Thank you again. Thank you very much. <laughs>